Call this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. Uh, and I may be begin by saying, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020 order, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in this order. So thank you everybody for being here tonight. Um, we're gonna begin with public input and for those that are members of the public that are here, the point of this is if anybody has any thoughts about something that is not on the agenda, we'll give you time to ask questions on any items that are on the agenda but I'll pause for a few seconds to see if anybody has any comments or any questions for the public input. Okay, hearing none, I move on. And we're gonna first start with our student report. And we are lucky enough to have Gianna, and I'm gonna probably screw up your name here, Navalo, um, as our student representative from the class of 2023. So Gianna, would you like to start? You need to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi. I'm Gianna Nalibo. I'm in the class of 2022. Oh. That's what you thought. Now you're 2023. Can you hear me? Kidding. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. <laughs> can you, uh, hello. <laughs> Okay, so starting with in school. Um, this week was Spirit Week for North Reading High School. It was, today was Flannel Day and tomorrow will be Spirit Day. And it's been very successful, We've seen a lot of school spirit. And also tomorrow is the end of the quarter. So students will be getting report cards and that marks the end of term quarter one. And then as for clubs and sports, um, both our, our girls and, and boys soccer teams came out Cal champions, so very exciting. And um, continue on sports, the students and the teams are working on like concrete information on the winter sports which i know is part of the agenda today and so far they've been holding informal practices to continue working and um interact is working on a mask fundraiser and deca and maskers both had successful mask fundraisers and are continuing upon them um, the DECA chapter at North Reading High School will be competing virtually and on a much different um, set of rules this time as well. And um, Notorious got accepted into the international competition, which is a huge feat, which is ICHSA. And they also got accepted into any voices to compete in the New England competition, which will, and they'll be receiving placements. As for student council, they attended the new mask um, conferences last week. I think Ms. Sanner knows in this successful, I thought that they were carried out great. And as for more holiday directed stuff, um, maskers will be holding Santa calling, which is they call people, kids can like get calls from Santa. So that's, um, Boys Lacrosse is starting their holiday wreaths fundraiser. And student council also did holiday card signing for the veterans, which was a school-wide event. Um, and to circle back to academics, something that I wanted to share, something that I thought was very, very successful within my classes, which was the use of 
specifically in my class, um, my world history class, we've been using Pear Deck to answer questions. So it's been really successful in keeping the students engaged. And honestly, in post COVID teaching, it would be like a great asset to the learning experience. So, yeah, that's all I have for today. Very good. Thank you, Gianna. I think it's, I think this is your first meeting, so congratulations. Uh, you you got to have any questions or one, comments? So. Gianna, nice job. It's got it's Janine. Janine, go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, I was just curious, um, how did the big uh, student council uh, meeting go last week? Uh, it's down in Hyannis, right? But that is so, our state conference, which I'm unsure on details about that one, but this was part of the smaller sector that we're part of, which is NEMASC, which is um, Northeast Massachusetts. Massachusetts Association of Student Councils. So, leadership building experience. I learned a lot. Good, thank you. I see a raised hand by Mr. Papavacelio. Chris, go ahead. I figured I'll use the feature. Uh, Gianna, great, great job. Um, as a guy named Papavacelio, I understand when Mr. Buckley has trouble with last names. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was really great that you pointed out uh, Pear Deck and that you thought um, that was good. It had been very helpful that some teachers have used. I was wondering, apart from uh, that, is there anything you've seen in classes so far that has happened, that, uh, some way of teaching that teachers are doing that's happened because of COVID, but that you think is a really cool thing that you hope they do more in the future? Um, sure. So, like I said, that interactive part part of school in general has been, I think, really effective, at least on my end, for like, because um, be a successful student. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. If I, Any if other I may, again, this is Dr. Daly. Go ahead, Dr. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, if I may, just to, I, I, I had the wrong, I had Paris's name in there and her grade, and then when I switched it, I think I left the wrong year. So, again, sorry about that, Jonna. You, you were talking <laughs> okay. a little bit about, and some of you, it, uh, when we meet with the other reps, we're talking about the um, some of the advantages to the remote and just also the late starts, if you wanted to give your two cents on that. Mm hmm So, um there's a lot of mixed opinions about the hybrid model, but overall, I think that they are very positive opinions. Um, obviously, it's to hybrid learning very well. And um, we talked about the late start, as Dr. Daly had mentioned, and it's very popular <laughs> among the students. It's, um, it's really helped with getting to do more things later into the night and not worrying about it, like especially like completing your assignments to the fullest potential that you can, things like that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Rich, any thoughts or? Well, I was just gonna say, and thank you for, for your report, Gianna, but I was gonna say we, we heard uh, Mr. Papa Fasileo uh, and I heard from the um, uh, folks in the fine arts in our fine arts uh, subcommittee, which we'll talk more about later. But we're talking about Notorious, and what's interesting is, that if I understood them correctly, they're going to be doing um, their performances in the, some of these uh, uh, competitions in the way that some people may have seen groups do, especially early on in the in the pandemic, where each individual person records their portion individually, and then they will have to bring them together and mix them together into one into one uh, presentation. So I think that will be really interesting and uh, 
uh, a good challenge for them uh, above and beyond just the music part of it. So uh, congratulations to them, of course, for getting accepted, but I thought that was interesting. Very good. Thank you. And Gianna, you're welcome to stay. I think if you could stay maybe through Dr. Daly's update, and then there is that one uh, part that uh, that uh, Principal LaPrat is going to talk about. I think it'd be great to have a student voice on that. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Daly to give the reopening update. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Buckley. So um, I think that so much has been covered this week. Um, certainly since our last meeting, we received some emails from parents who had questions about our decision to go into the <clears throat> the hybrid um, from the hybrid into the full remote for the few days leading into Thanksgiving. We had to clarify that you know that information came out Friday morning, Friday afternoon. Governor Baker came out with some new additional information um, about what they were thinking in terms of districts, you know, trying to bring students back more in person. And so we felt the need to have a clarifying parent forum and listening forum and. I would say just, you know, based on attendance and feedback received that it was successful in, in its goal of trying to communicate more information. There's just so much out there and so many questions and, and uh, great comments came in. I had over 800 uh, families respond to the survey and we had over 500 people. Um, there's a limit of 250 within Google and then another um, several hundred were able to join live and that, um, my kids were, were impressed with me for the first time tonight because I told them I had 1. Uh, 1, uh, 1. 7 thousand views on uh, YouTube already from Tuesday. So um, I know Mr. Buckley probably watched it 500 times, so that could be part of it. But um, no, but I think it was uh, good information that, that folks wanted to hear. And, um, you know, like, like I shared, you had 60% of the people feeling uh, one way, 40% feeling the other. People are certainly divided. There's a lot of uh, mixed emotions, but I think certainly having um, some clarity about the district's position was helpful. And I think sometimes, you know, having any answer in uncertain times is helpful. And so that's really what we tried to provide. And um, that information I did share out with the entire community um, through Blackboard, and it's on the blog as well for folks that want to view and, and review any of the questions that are there. So I feel like there was a lot answered. Maybe there's some questions that folks might have for me following from that. But I will say also that, um, you know, one of the things that we, we certainly thought was important was to gather more parent and teacher feedback on the calendar change for December. And the, the question that came out, there were over um, close to 500 responses on that survey. And it was, it's about 93% in favor of the changes recommended for the December calendar which would be the, you know, three solid weeks once we get back, followed by the uh, amended, so it would be remote days on the 21st and 22nd. And for students, the 23rd would be a full day um, that they would not be coming to school at all. That would be essentially to them an earlier start to the vacation. And then we would have to look and adjust the calendar moving forward in terms of balancing the cohorts and making sure we have you know, all of the days for the calendar that are that are to be um, accomplished this year. However, it's um, an, an opportunity to get those three solid weeks and also to have less time missed with the conferences, all of that being combined in those days. So it was pretty overwhelmingly positive. Um, when you just look at just the parents that responded, it was about 90% in favor, and the teachers and the teachers who were also parents, it was 100% in favor. So... I think that that's um, a pretty good sign that we should probably move forward with that. And I, I think everyone just wants to know the sooner the better that, that those are the, the actual dates. So any questions for me at this time? If people can raise their hand or type in if anybody from the public has comments as well. I will just say, Dr. Daly, I really appreciated you having that forum. Um, it's great to see how many uh, people attended. I do know that a couple of things that came out of there, there's also been follow up on already as well. Some questions came up about uh, the transition from fifth grade to sixth grade. And I know there's uh, another parent forum that is going to be scheduled to talk about that. Um, there are some questions about kindergarten. And I just overall appreciate that, you know, Dr. Dale, you, you're always on top of it and trying to communicate. I understand that, you know, a lot of people are concerned about 
how things are happening. And, you know, I communicated with a lot of parents before the forum as well. And I just think I appreciate the parents that are, you know, presuming positive in, intent. And I just think overall, we all have to understand that there's no perfect way to do any of this. We're all trying. Um, people are trying to communicate, you know, over communicate and really uh, do what we think is best. And, you know, we understand that next week is going to be challenging with kids out of school and doing remote. But, you know, there, there's some counter counterweights as well, which is what made us do it. So that's just my comments. I just appreciated your, um, you know, your transparency about it and, and taking all those questions. And I don't know, did I, I'll kind of go through the committee quickly to see if anybody has any comments. Um, Mr. McGowan, I, I, I do know every every committee member was also at that parent forum. And so I appreciate my fellow, fellow committee members as well um, taking the time to, to participate as well. Uh, Mr. McGowan. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I, I, I it was a uh, it was a it was a good forum, I thought. And there was a lot of uh, uh, a lot of good questions, a lot of good good sort of back and forth in in the chat. Um, uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, everyone who was able to attend, but I, I think it worked out well. Mr. Buckley. Yes, go ahead. May I, may I just say thank you to all those that attended, including those folks from the town who were there, who also provided feedback afterwards and some commented during the meeting. And there were some questions that I, I didn't get to, but I did get a transcript of the chat and I am going to reach out to some of those folks individually. And then, as you mentioned, there are some follow-up forums. There's the schools are doing something with the kindergartens and the uh, Ms. Dr. O'Connell and I have worked uh, to have a, a forum for kindergarten, I'm sorry, for sixth grade um, next week. So I think that will be very important as well. Excellent. Um, Chris, Chris P and uh, Janine had no comments um, and neither does Ms. Boutwell. So if anybody from the public has any comments, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute. And if not, we will move on to, and again, I'm, I'm going to just jump ahead. And so um, Principal O'Krat, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to hear from you. And I know I'm a little bit out of order here, but uh, an update on a potential change for the North Reading High School this year. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Uh, so I'm going to be speaking for a couple of moments here on um, a memo that I sent to uh, Dr. Daly and um, Mr. Colleen as the um, in, you know, incoming assistant uh, superintendent. Um, and the, the topic of the memo, which I'm hoping you have a copy of, it's my understanding that the members of the committee have seen a copy of the memo. Um, is speak, speaks to our normal routine of having mid-year exams. And as I've requested in the memo uh, for uh, Dr. Daly's approval, um, my request to uh, kind of suspend the mid-year exam for this year. Uh, the reason behind that uh, are many. Um, Obviously, with the with the impact of the of the virus and the number of things that we are doing differently, our hybrid model, um, the logistics around, uh, you know, maximizing our opportunities for instruction, for in person instruction, for the uh, the remote model, and that's effectiveness. Uh, right now, with our normal uh, mid year exam, the the mid year exam is ten percent of the grade. And the final exam makes up 10% of the grade. Quarter grades are 20%. So, um, as we, and that's that's just kind of the um, the one side of it. Never mind the the scheduling side. But just to talk about the, the <coughs> equity, the the fairness, the um, impact on on learning, um, in saying that uh, we're going to hold students to the same 10% weight of uh, a mid-year exam um this is a topic that i reviewed with the leadership team i had input from other kpn principals um and many of them are i would say if they haven't already phased out mid-year exams they are um making this same move and that just the idea of saying that 10 percent of your grade right now um is going to be determined by a mid-year exam experience 
where we're all learning uh, and growing through our hybrid model differently. <clears throat> Um, as much as I think we try to make it as equitable as we can, um, now do it now. And again, that's kind of the philosophical side. The, the practical side, again, even also on a um, with respect to the impact on students, student learning directly. What we would have to do with the cohort model is um, essentially double the time of mid-year exams. It wouldn't be a one week; it would be two weeks. Um, and again, another impact on instructional time in the classroom. I think we'd be looking at questions around test integrity. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think one might say, well, you know, couldn't a portion of the um, exam be kind of a take home? Uh, and then to say, well, you know, I think we all might deal with those things differently. And I'm not sure what's being tested on a take-home exam all the time? What are we really assessing? Um, so I think there are a number of reasons. I, I, I hope I've made them clear in the memo. I hope I've made them a little more clear in uh, my presentation of that idea. Um, what we would do right now is ultimately, um, you know, at this point, if we were to cancel, the, you know, suspend or cancel the, the mid-year exam, we could move forward with the idea that we still may have a final exam and we could have the quarters weight at 23% and then an 8% final exam um, and see, you know, see how we could go with that. Uh, and that's really the contents of the memo and the request of the superintendent. And, and, and again, my hope for your support uh, this evening. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. LaPrat. So, committee members first, any comments or questions? Not all at once. I, I will start off and say, uh, go ahead. I had the hand up, Mr. Buck. Go ahead, Chris. It's a new system. Um, so, Mr. LaPrat, I appreciate, I appreciate two things. I appreciate you sharing this with us, and I appreciate kind of trying to approach a difficult problem and come up with a, a, a solution to it as opposed to just moving on with things as normal. Um, so thank you. I feel for the kids and, and, and all the stress involved and, and, and also the, the logistical difficulties that you did a good job of pointing out. Um, I see in the memo the idea that uh, there will be some sorts of common assessments and, and that this has been this, – this proposal is – come with a lot of input from a lot of sources. So I assume that this isn't going to be an issue of teachers. Now you got to figure out something else, you know, um, and pulling out the rug from under them. But I, um, I, I do want to say that moving away from, from mid-years this year in particular, but just in general, is a, is a pretty good move towards finding other ways to assess kids that approaches a lot of different learning styles. It's something that, um, that I was seeing in, in, in my school in Wakefield uh, for the last few years. So it's, it's it's definitely one of those things that maybe we come out of COVID trying new things out and finding out that they work. I I am curious. Will there be requirements in each classroom that there's some sort of assessment that there's some sort of thing going on as opposed to just we're going to spend a little bit more time on this chapter? Thank you. Uh, uh, happy to answer that question. So so this is something that uh, again that the. Um, the leadership team recognizes, I think, exactly the point that you're saying is, you know, if we go away from this, what are we really losing everything? And I, and I think collectively, I'm very confident in saying that the common assessment um, uh, model and the, the, that approach that has been employed, um, and while while I would I would say, you know, across um, departments um, at you know, different times, I would say different units might have components of common assessment in them anyway. Uh, I think that's certainly the message for the uh, kind of quarter two uh, assessments, end of quarter two assessment. Can we make sure that we are identifying certain questions, certain um, methodologies that would be consistent across sections uh, that would allow us to continue to measure um, you know, in that uh, the same uh, breadth of student growth and relying on um, standards that we've recognized in the past that we do want to see across uh, assessments, uh, across sections and across grade levels. So, yes, that is something that uh, 
I, while I failed to mention it in my presentation, it is certainly covered in the memo, um, and that is supported at the leadership team level, yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Laprade, I, I have a couple of comments and questions. Um, the, the first one is, I actually hadn't even thought of the, you know, the idea of how you actually do it fairly, because if half the group is in, in person and half the group is out of person, and I imagine you, you can't do it at different times, because then there's the worry that, you know, one group has already seen it and then could talk to a friend about what's on it. Um, if you give two different exams, that would be a little bit, you know, off if one of them's at home. And so there's technical issues or any sort of distractions. So I think, I, I think just from a logistical standpoint, I, I think it makes a lot of sense that I, I, I just don't know exactly how you do it the completely fairly and equitably if you don't do this. Um, but beyond that, I think everybody will wonder like, well, you know, what, what the, what the future holds with this. Um, and I think with anything we're doing, we're, we're saying this is only for one year, but what I hope is that we really are evaluating what this means. And so with anything, like, I hope that we use this year, not just as a, we're not doing it this year because it's hard to do this year, but I hope we use this as a pilot and really put some metrics in place some some evaluation, maybe even do some student surveys some teacher surveys from this really to see what this means so that you know with anything that we're changing during covid i think it's valuable to look to look back whenever we go back full time in person to really see what worked and what didn't work so i just would encourage you to put some metrics in place to evaluate this as a pilot so that we can learn from it a little bit at the end yeah absolutely i think we're absolutely on the same page there um and and those metrics uh, and those, you know, the, those assessment uh, reviews will definitely uh, be taking place at the leadership team level so that we can gain as much as we can out of the experience um, and, and use it to, to kind of shape, well, let's just say informed decision making. Um, but, but like you, I think, you know, uh, I, I'm of the same belief of if we're just going to decide to stop doing something, doesn't have that force us to ask, why did we ever do it in the first place if it's just that easy to stop doing it? So um, it'll be a very thoughtful approach, trust me. Okay. Jana, did you have any thoughts on this? Um, thank you, Mr. LaPred. I thought that was a great um, presentation. And I think that the, the proposed option seems very well thought out. And I agree that it suits the hybrid model very well. Ms. Cronin put, put in the chat that it's a great opportunity to Im implement UDL for assessments as well. We've, we've talked about UDL a little bit at some of our previous meetings. So I don't know are there, if there's anybody else who raise your hand if you have any other comments or thoughts. If not, I, I will note in the memo, it looks like we actually have, there's a request for two different um votes it looks like there's this vote and then there's also a vote for a change to the schedule i don't know if that's something that we need to do here as well dr daly or is that part of another piece of this i'm sorry to say the so at the end of the memo that's showing right now it says your approval is also requested for a small change in no uh, uh, it says your approval is also requested for a small change in the school calendar and i don't know if no, go down right underneath yeah, okay, if i can speak to that yeah i i was just letting uh dr daly know that i had intended to move our parent teacher conference back one week um given the uh well the full remote model uh after um on the 30th you know what i mean we just it, we felt like we might need a little more time with we would never have we never have grades around thanksgiving the grading process, the quarter one usually ends the first week of November. So now that we've ended quarter one, um, and, and this is a point that I, that Gianna, um, I want to go back to something you had mentioned. The grades still have to be completed and calculated and pushed out into the student portal. So because Thanksgiving kind of messes that up a little bit because we're not really doing, we never really have the calendar, uh, the quarter calendar impacted by Thanksgiving. 
I had asked Dr. Daly if we could bump the parent-teacher conference night back one week to the seventh. That's the, that's the bottom of that memo. And so I guess to Dr. Daly, I just don't know if that's something that you need a school committee vote on or not. I just want to make sure that I know all the motions you want. Yeah, I, I hold on. Am I am I on? You are. I am great. <laughs> I'm, I'm, mul I'm doing multiple screens again. Um, yeah, I believe that you know we could we could just vote on both of these items separately. Um, that might just be effective. We could also. You know, I don't have it on there officially to vote on the calendar change for December, but we could just vote on both updates to the calendar. I, you know, I do think that the changing of a, a you know, I don't know the school committee always votes when we change or postpone a, a, you know, a conference day or something, but I think it's, it doesn't hurt to do that. Right. So. Okay. So why don't I, why don't I first entertain a motion to um, accept the, suspension of midterm examinations at the high school for the 2020-2021 school year. I move that we suspend mid-year exams at the high school for the 2020-2021 school year. Second. Okay, if you need to do a roll call vote, Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Rich? Can you hear me? Yes. Aye. Sorry. Shanine? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes five to zero. Um, and just for overkill, we'll do a motion to uh, entertain a motion to push back the parent teacher conferences um, at the high school for by one week as well. I move that we push back the kind of teacher conferences for the high school by one week. Second. Roll call vote, Chris. Aye. Diana. Aye. Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. I'm an aye as well. That passes 5 0 as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. LaPratt. Mr. Uh, Buck, do, do we want to just, I mean, it's not on the agenda as a, as a calendar change vote, but. Do we just want to take a vote on the December changes so that we can then just broadcast that out? I mean, we had approved already the, the high, what's really changing are the, the elementary conferences and the PDA, PD day being moved. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I think it's a clarification more than anything because yeah. we did approve, we did approve already remote on the, on the days before December. So right. already now is just clarifying that they will be the parent teacher conference days and professional development so right. it's not so it's not changing who's going to be in school or anything like that we already did that uh -huh. but yeah i'll entertain a motion on for those changes as well chris uh, you're right again. yeah no i'm happy to i just uh i don't have them in front of me to enunciate them all uh i move that we adopt the changes uh for the conferences that dr daly just mentioned second okay roll call vote chris aye Diana. Aye. Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes 5 0. Thank you very much, Dr. Daly. Thank you, Mr. LaPrat. And we're going to go back up to Sophia. Sophia is going to talk a little bit about a potential new program, a new uh, club. So, Sophia, I turn it over to you. Okay, I'm going to present my screen. Wonderful. <clears throat> All right. You can see it, right? You can. Yes. Okay, great. All right. So first, I just want to give a little overview about myself, talk about myself a little bit. So I actually did prepare this in sign language because I have been doing a little bit of research on it. So Hello. Um, you can see my hands, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's being shown. Yep. Okay. Um, my name is Sophia. Um, I am a senior at NRHS. I play um, tennis and volleyball. Um, I'm in DECA. 
um, Red Cross yearbook and NHS. So then I just want to talk a little bit about how I developed my passion for sign language. So I was with my friend Grace Gorman a couple of weeks ago when we were talking and we were on YouTube and a video came up about um, the uh, the alphabet for sign language. And we were just like, we should we should learn it because I have been thinking about it a lot in the past, but I never really thought to like actually pursue it as a language. And then I just I watched that video and then eventually I started watching more about the um, greetings and farewells. So then we were thinking that we should make it a club at the school because you know there's not um, there's not a class for it. There it's not in the world language program. So the first thing that we'd be able to do is start a club. So then we reached out to Mr. Hain. And here we are. So first I'll just give an overview. So this is the write-up that I composed, um, just a description about the club. So um, American Sign Language is an introductory club designed to teach students basic signing skills as well as the culture and history of the deaf community. Members will be expected to participate in identifying finger-spelled words and key phrases and questions pertaining to greetings, farewells, and conversations. Members will learn to maintain a conversation in American Sign Language, as well as raise money to donate to many organizations supporting the deaf community. We will also use our donations to fund the necessary supplies and resources to grow our education. We intend to invite guest speakers from the deaf community to join our discussion and help us expand our knowledge. So what we hope to accomplish as a club. So my first point is that I don't want this to just run as um, a club for just this year, obviously. So I am a senior, so I'm obviously going to be graduating in May. But um, in the future, you know, I want it to run next year. Like I can use the um, the members of the club this year to help me make it run next year, as well as Miss Saint Arnaud, who's my sponsor or my mentor for it. Um, and I also just really think it's important that we raise more awareness about sign language in the deaf community, especially to North Reading, because there are a lot of um, verbally impaired um, st students and also just like citizens of North Reading who would really enjoy having a club here. Um, and also, I think it's important not only for me, but for members of the club to teach leadership, commitment and dedication because so an example for this would be since there is already um, Spanish and French classes at the school, um, students are required to take that for, I believe, um, the first two years, so freshman and sophomore years, but I have um, done um, my Spanish class up until senior year, so I'm in my fifth year, but I think it's really important that since it's required for students to take those first two classes and actually make an education out of it, I feel like they have it embedded in their heads that, you know, like they need to learn it because they need to get a good grade or they need to pass it because it's going to go on their transcript for colleges. But this way, it shows dedication to learning a new language because the students are not forced to take this club. You know, they're they're volunteering because they want to learn, because they actually want to expand their knowledge. So it really shows who wants to learn and who's just there because they have to be. So how the club will run. So um, a couple of days ago, I think it was on Monday, I sent out a Google form to the freshmen, um, to the class officers of each grade and they then sent out a Google form to their um, class group me. So then I got a lot of responses about people who'd be interested. And right now I have 24 people who are already interested in the club. And that's just my first initial rough estimate. I have a lot more people who just haven't got around to emailing me yet or joining the Google Classroom. But um, among those um, participants, I'm going to get into this later, but um, one of them is actually fluent in American Sign Language. So that's going to be a great asset for us. And I think it's important that we're going to meet virtually because of the cohorts. So um, I'm thinking we start off um, every other week so that it's not too much of a force for especially seniors applying to college and juniors trying to get their work done. And just in general for the students um, to ease into the school year a little bit more. So um, how, how it's going to run is 
I would think that we would use the cafeteria because Mr. Hain mentioned that it's a um, good place for clubs to meet because the the desks are already six feet apart. And that way I was thinking that they would run on Thursdays because um, I'm in cohort B, so I'm in school on Thursdays so that I would be able to be there um, uh, on the Google Meet while cohort A or cohort D or even cohort B, if they're not there, um, they'll be able to join remotely. And so this is a really great resource. Let me go into it. So I researched about um, some courses that we could take online and I found Sign Language 101. So there are free videos here. So we'll scroll down and there's ABCs and colors and pronouns antonyms and common phrases, all of these videos, and it actually like takes you through a 10 week course. And there's also, if I go to start lesson one, there is a course that costs $25 that includes like 700 vocabulary and um, longer videos. So that would be something to um, think about, but that um, also comes with a lot of fundraising. So I'm gonna get into that though, oh, oops. Um, so we could, we have two options to buy the guided course or to sign up for the free courses, which I would think that the free courses would be our best bet right now, considering we won't be able to fundraise. And then maybe in the future, we'd be able to buy textbooks for the club, club members because, um, say a club member is really interested in the club and they don't just want to limit themselves to just the meetings every other week or every week so they will want to take their textbooks home you know learn independently so that'd be a good option for them and then fundraising so with covid our fundraising is obviously very restricted because in a normal school year we'd be able to do bake sales and special holiday sales and stuff like that but with the regulations we're obviously not able to do that this year so i would say that this year we would just start off of zero dollars because that's obviously very possible for us we do our free courses online we don't do textbooks and we just maybe don't do donations just for a little while we get um on off the ground and then it's also an option for us to just um collect donations so um there is a really great organization that i was researching the american society for deaf children so i'm sure that there would be a lot of students um who would be willing to just donate like out of pocket. I know I would. So we would we could set up um kind of like the the pennies that we would do like last year, I'm pretty sure. So it would be something like that where we just collect donations and then all the proceeds would go to organizations. Um guest speakers. So this is a very important aspect of um for the club to me. So I think that it's really important that we have like a tangible um, source from someone that actually knows American Sign Language or who's in the deaf community knows someone from the deaf community. So it's my hope that we'd be able to have them come in like maybe two to three times a year. Um, so I already reached out to, I think, two people so far. So m my um, one of my teachers, Mrs. Pierce, she um, I was talking to her about the club and she said that she uh, had a deaf friend who'd be really willing to come and help us, you know, learn more about the community and tell us about her story. So she's definitely an option. And then one of the girls who, um, who emailed me about her interest in the club when I sent out the Google form, she actually expressed to me that her, I believe it's her mom and her dad, they both are um, deaf. So she speaks American Sign Language in her day-to-day -day life, so she knows it fluently. So she is going to be a great aspect, aspect of the um, club. She's going to be able to help us with, you know, confusing words, stuff that we don't know. And also, she said that her mom would be willing to come in and talk to us. So that's really great. And if they're not comfortable, you know, coming in or if it's not allowed, then they'd be able to join us remotely because we'd be doing it off of Google Meet anyways. And... You know, they just tell us their story, how um, being deaf has impacted them, and some new phrases that we might not seem to, like, think to learn in the courses or that might not be taught to us. And I added a note that translation might be necessary for this because they might be um, 
verbally impaired, so they might not be able to actually speak English while they're doing um, their sign language. So Catherine would be a would come in clutch here, and she would be able to um, translate for us. So the future of American Sign Language. So we are proposing this club in hopes of having it run years and years ahead of us. As I said before, I want it to. I want to be able to leave my mark at North Reading, and you know go off with a bang and actually have a legacy here because um, now that I'm a senior, I'm gonna be graduating soon and I, I just wanna be able to leave strongly. So I feel like this is the perfect way to do it because it's gonna um, add something really great to the curriculum, really great to the community. So as I mentioned, um, next year, new officers would be elected and we'd be doing this so, um, me and um, probably Miss Saint are now. We'd discuss, you know, who who's participating the most, who's um, most intrigued in the club, and then we'd go off of that and maybe do a vote about who would be the officers for next year. And I also have some ideas about um, maybe getting some officers for this year along with me. So I'd be the president, and then I might have, you know, a vice president to help me with some of the the meetings, and then treasurer for like fundraising and stuff like that. And then um, I think that it was either Miss St. or No or Mr. Hain, but they mentioned to me that um, there is a middle school class for um, American Sign Language, but I don't think it's official. But um, that would give us a lot more interest because they would be able to, you know, the middle schoolers would come in their freshman year and be like, oh, I already took this class and I would be really interested in joining the club. So it would give us a lot more, you know, members and they'd be able to tell their friends. So it'd give us a lot more. And yeah, that's all I have. So well, questions? Excellent presentation, Sophia. That was, that was beautiful. Very nice. Questions. questions. Mr. Chris, you raised your hand. Yeah, um, I'll echo what Everyone just said that. I've been in meetings where people have pitched full classes before that weren't as well thought out as this. Thank you. Really excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, I really, I don't have any questions. I just think you did an incredible job. And I think that um, it's a laudable idea that in your senior year, instead of thinking about um, what it's going to be like to leave, you're thinking about what you can leave behind. And, exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah, I think that's inspirational, and I I, I hope that this is uh, just a huge success. Thank you, I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, and there's some nice comments coming in. I'll read as well. Uh, Mrs. Capizzuto said, "Bravo, Sophia, for the effort." I recommend you reach out to the Scene Collaborative, which has three classrooms in the hood for the hearing impaired and our younger grades. These children will be coming up and would benefit from this program, which I think is a great idea. Um, another one said, "Awesome job! Excited to be part of this project." <laughs> Do other people have comments? Uh, Mr. LaPratt? Thank you. So we had tremendous, really nicely done. Um, what I think, assuming that as this meeting uh, proceeds the way we hope it will, <laughs> um, we'll talk. Uh, so, so one of the things as the principal, I have access to some funds through the rebate account. Um, and that those are funds that are reserved specifically for um, student projects and direct uh, student enhancement programs. Okay. Um, and I think we should talk. Let's just let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed here with the, with respect to moving forward, and and we'll catch up. Excellent. And I, and I so I, I will add a couple of things. That my I know my son who's in sixth grade. He has a teacher who I believe is hearing impaired. And so there might be a teacher in the middle school that might be interested. I would love to see, you know, I would love to see this expand beyond, the, you know, some community aspect of it, but also middle school. I think this would be a great, you know, thing to start in middle school because with any language, it takes a long time to learn, you know, and if you're only doing this as a club once a week, I think it would be great if, you know, if you start with the high school and then maybe even expand it beyond. And I was actually just going to say something kind of like Mr. LaPratt, where you know, I think I think it's a really meaningful opportunity, and I would hate for funding to stop it from starting. Yeah. Like if you think it's twenty five dollars or whatever, I mean, I would say I would personally help you know to you know fund that. So like when you talk to Mr. LaPratt, if there's 
you know, if there's some, some funding needed, please, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I think it's a meaningful, you know, a meaningful project to do and to get off and running. And I think, I think clubs probably have, you know, funding eventually, but if they're a new club, yeah, um, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to help support this personally as well because I think it's very meaningful. So, um, this is Adriano. Hi, I'm on the the phone and the anyway. Um, Leanne, I'm sorry, I'm calling you your sister's name. Oh my sorry, gosh. Sophia. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually had a uh, hearing impaired friend when I was younger and. Her mom taught me how to ask if she wanted to sleep at my house, which was really fun. And we, I didn't speak of, you know, her hand, um, sign, any other language than that. But we just ran around and had a great time. So um, this is really a, a really nice idea. Um, very proud of you for thinking about it and taking the initiative and, and you know, going forward. So um, I would like to also, you know, offer if you need any help financially, just uh, ring the doorbell and let me know. Thank you. Great. Mr. Buckley? Yes, Dr. Daly. So, Sophia, fantastic presentation. We were very, very excited to hear that tonight. It was very well done, as, as others have mentioned. Um, I see Ms. St. Arnaud is on the line as well. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think ASL can be a um, language that you could do the seal of biliteracy. You know, so if this is something that you started – at an early enough level, you could um, <laughs> proficient. I don't know if Ms. St. Arnaud can, can acknowledge that. Um, or, sure, or yeah, thanks. Um, so Sophia, I mean, I have to publicly say how happy I am to be proud of this project. Um, and you know, I'm so glad you brought me in. Um, so this American Sign Language, um, just to clarify, is a world language. American Sign Language is not an interpretation of English or a translation of English or something like that. It is its own language. Um, and um, the Seal of Literacy is available to students um, who learn um, American Sign Language. Um, I'm so proud of Sophia as well for recognizing that um, language leads with culture. Um, and several times in her presentation, she mentioned that just learning the signs is really not learning or understanding a language. Um, understanding the people who communicate in this language is really the key um, to all languages. And I personally, I have a, a passion for student leadership. I have a passion for promoting interculturality and certainly for multilingualism as well. And so this is a really exciting project. And, um, you know, I think right now ASL is really having a moment um, at, during COVID as we all turn on the TV and watch the governor or the mayor speak. Um, and usually there is, um, you know, someone signing next to them, um, you know, in the press or whatnot. There's been a lot of attention put on American Sign Language. And I love how Sophia is taking this moment and making it a movement, um, something that we can really, um, you know, take beyond, you know, what we see with Governor Baker and, um, you know, Mayor Walsh and whatnot on TV. So, um, yeah, so this is really great. And um, I am for those of you who don't know me, I am the curriculum coordinator of world languages. And so someday if this grows um, to be more than a club, if somehow this grows into course offerings, um, you know, that's of course something that I'm very happy to be part of. Excellent. Thanks, Amy. Excellent. Mr. LaPrat, I see your yeah. hand up still. Thank you. I just was going to, um, I wanted to say what I, what I didn't say when I was initially uh, thanking Sophia for her presentation is that, I mean, what, as the principal, you know, I want to think about the breadth of my role and the importance of it. But when we have an opportunity to expand the community and recognize that as much as we think we might be doing on reaching out to people and, you know, and, and celebrating the success that we've had as our own community, when we can expand that, um, which is I think exactly what this is, it's, uh, it's, it's the best of what we can do. So. I just wanted to share that and thank you again, Sophia. Thank you. So clearly a lot of opposition here. Mr. Hain. Unmuted. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, working with Sophia at the start of this project, it was great to see the passion that she had for this. And I think this is something that, you know, as a person that gets to work with a lot of kids every day, to see someone who has a passion and a fire lit and be able to pursue that. There were some other kids that were interested in it, but for different reasons, uh, they kind of backed out of that. But so it was it was really nice to see Sophia grow already in that role of I'm passionate about this. I want to make this happen. 
and um, she's really, really um, excelled at, at, at putting this presentation together and having a vision for how this could happen. Um, I'm really proud of her. This is, I think, something to see kids want to learn something for the sake of learning it and applying it for the community is really what learning is all about. So I was so impressed with that and I'm excited for this to get off the ground. And um, it was great to see her work that hard with that and, and with the help of Ms. St. Arnaud. So it was, it was really terrific. Nice job, Sophia. Thank you. I just want to add to that really quickly. So um, I wanted to talk about the interest that I had with the students who um, reached out to me about their interest in the club. So I had multiple students reach out to me saying, thank you so much for like making this club a, um, a part of North Reading because Catherine, the one who um, her parents are deaf, she was saying how she wanted to start the club for so long, but she didn't know how to, or she didn't know where to start. So basically she was just expressing her gratitude that I was actually able to start it so or present it. So basically I just am saying that um, there is interest in every student as much as my passion is for American Sign Language, but I'm just presenting it and they're just not like, they're just not showing it as much, but eventually we'll all be able to show it throughout the club. Excellent. Great job. Great job. Um, okay. So again, I have a feeling how this is going to go, but I, I would like to entertain a motion to approve American Sign Language Club as a high school club starting this year. Scott, I will move to uh, that, that we vote to approve the American Sign Language Club as a club to start this year after such a wonderful presentation. I second. I second. Okay, second by Chris. He beat you in there. So we'll do a roll call vote. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes 5 0. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Sophia. Thank but, you. Mr. Berry, let me just say yeah. to you, I, I just want to thank uh, all the students as well as the advisors and Mr. Hayne and Mr. Lepret. This is my first time going through this process. Typically, clubs are, are um, presented and approved in May for the following year. But due to the situation last spring, obviously, we made some different decisions. And so we've been trying to pull everything together this fall. So there's a few other student ideas and clubs that we hope to be able to present at our next meeting as well. So, Excellent. Okay. Moving on. Mr. Hain, I assume you don't have your hand up still, right? Nothing else? Um, thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson, I believe we have now for a winter sports update. I turn it over to you, Mr. Johnson. Sophia, you're a tough act to follow. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm nervous. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, Dr. Dale, are you going to uh, show the uh, program on the screen? Can you share that? It's up there, yep. Okay, good. Um, well, yeah, I, I remember talking about fall sports, trying to get that going. And um, I have to say, uh, the kids did a fantastic job in the fall, you know, on really the. Uh, how important it was and obviously winter sports starting up um, it's been a uh, a slow process to be honest with you I was really hoping we'd be able to present this sooner but um, you know the MIA was pretty much uh, waiting for the uh, Office of Energy and uh, Environmental Affairs uh, you can go to the second slide um, yeah uh, to really um, lead in this and from those some of their um, uh, requirements that they were having for this. The MIA acted on it uh, kind of late, and then everything went down to the um, specific sport committees, which are, have met as recently as, you know, yesterday and the day before yesterday to try and get uh, some of the hockey and the basketball things um, ironed out. So it's been an ongoing process, and um, you can go to the next slide. Traditionally, winter sports start the Monday after Thanksgiving. And as we all know, we're not having a Thanksgiving Day football game this year. But uh, traditionally, uh, what they've done is um, there are no winter sp uh, tournaments by the uh, MIA, just like there were no fall tournaments. So there's a definite start date and a definite um, end date. We know it's going to end on February 21st. And it looks like it's going to be more like December 14th is when... Uh, the MI is going to allow you to begin 
winter sports. Um, I think they all wanted that little bit of time after the holidays to see how that affected your community um, without the athletics starting up right away. So the sports that they have approved for the winter time are, you know, boys and girls basketball, boys and girls hockey, boys and girls swimming, and gymnastics. Cheering and um, boys and girls indoor track have been bumped to uh, different um, uh, seasons. Um, wrestling as well, Mr. And wrestling as well, correct. Um, although it looks like wrestling, you know, might just be um, kind of a club sport, you know, for, uh, um, you know, if it doesn't happen in the wintertime. You know, I, I don't really know. I don't have a lot of confidence in wrestling even happening. But I think the indoor track piece of that is going to get bumped to the wedge season, which will be the season after this, which, which will start on February 22nd. So this is the timeline for the traditional winter sport uh, season right now and also the sports that they're going to allow during it. You go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, gone over a little bit already. Um, what we're looking to do is, again, just Cape Ann League schedules. Um, usually the winter season is a little bit more in terms of uh, uh, tends to be a lot of non-leaguers. There's uh, games. There's a lot of times where you're playing in Christmas tournaments or February tournaments, and there's a lot of um, uh, interleague play. That's not going to happen, um, just like in the fall. It's going to be strictly a Cape Ann League schedule, which will begin the beginning of January. So from mid-December to the end of December will be the uh, tryouts and practices. And when you come back that first week, uh, the five or six days in January is when the games will start. Um, 10 to 11 games, which you know, it doesn't sound like a lot when you look at how many games are usually played, but I can tell you in the fall, that really did seem like a lot. And I think when you're, and we're playing every team in the league once, so it's a real flavor for who is the real league champion. And uh, I think there's a competition all the way through for everybody. Um, there's a lot of sport modifications, everything from wearing masks while you're playing hockey and um, basketball to the, um, restrictions you have in terms of, um, uh, you know, how close you can get to the opponent at certain times during the contest, things like that. So those are all coming out by the MIA um, specific sport committees. And uh, I think there's even going to be some more modifications before December 14th. Okay. There are some things we've talked about. Um, from the AD point of view. Um, and this was what we started with in the fall. Um, Where's there, there were no um, spectators or fans allowed. Um, and I know that wasn't very popular. And then we did eventually have a sign up where parents of the players in the game were allowed to sign up and show up. Um, but that was, those were outdoor events. I really think that Right now, we're looking at no spectators and no fans allowed, and that could possibly be for the duration of the season. I know we just installed a huddle camera in our gymnasium, so parents will be able to stream the games um, with their own account. And um, there's a lot of things like, uh, you know, locker room availability, restroom availability. Um, in the fall, students had to come dressed for um, – practices and games when they were in school and that's fine for soccer and cross country and things like that but you know it's not like you're going to have kids you know with their hockey gear you know walking through um, uh, school all day so there are some protocols that we might have to you know allow in terms of kids being able to go home before they come back to the bus to change um there is a thing where you know when you are a remote student you need to get yourself after school to the bus, um, you know, to the bus time, you know, uh, uh, that are, are picked up on campus. So, um, you know, that's something that games are starting a little bit later in the fall and they'll start a little bit later in the spring. We talked a little bit about with basketball, it's going to be very difficult to play the traditional, um, it's not called freshman anymore, it's called JV2, but, you know, the way you used to do a JV2 game, then a JV1 game, and then a varsity game in our gym from 4, 5.30 and 7 o'clock. It looks like we're only going to be able to do two levels on those days. We're going to have to move the JV1 games to a different day um, because now you also have the 930 curfew that you have to get kids back, 
you know, to their um, respective homes by that time. So we're probably looking at like about a four and a six o'clock start times for basketball. Um, the athletic trainer availability, you know, we're going to have to have some protocols on that for the room in terms of uh, it's not a big room. And sometimes it can get really busy in there. During the fall, we had one of the locker rooms down on the turf that was des designated just for um, uh, Rachel Hanna and her, um, you know, place to be down there with Harmeling PT. So we're going to have to do a little bit of, um, you know, spacing and distancing with that um, for the um, for this. Uh, in terms of like you know mass social distancing, that's all a piece of it. And um, uh, you know when we are you know we when we're hosting here, a lot of times in the district, it's the home team you know decisions on um, uh, how events are going to be run. You know we know we can do it North Reading, but if we go to Pentucket or Newburyport, they might have a different way of doing it. But um, like I said, I think the biggest thing on this slide right now is that first one, no spectators or fans allowed. And um, that's something that will work out as we go along. Um, let me see. I kind of went over a lot of these things already. Um, the spectators, the uh, live streaming. And um, and I know some of the um, other cat. I, I know a lot. I, I think just about every team in the Cape Ann League is going to have a way to stream a game in their gymnasium. Um, currently, right now, kids are signing up on Family ID for the sports that I just mentioned. And we are not asking for any uh, user fees to be um, uh, paid at this time. Uh, we will wait until um, we really know that we're starting December 14th and then We've always gotten the money in, so I'm really not concerned about that um, for some of the kids. But, you know, by the time we get the games going in the uniforms, we'll have all that in. I know there was a little bit of a sliding scale that uh, Mike Conley and I worked on a little bit for the fall about um, if a season gets cut short, um, you know, coaches' pay would be a, um, a cut a little bit and um, a little bit about even if, um, you know, the, the, the season got cut down for – whatever reason, whether it's a North Reading decision or a Massachusetts decision, um, whether there's some type of stipend refunds, but uh, that's the language we're working on right now. And this is another thing too, uh, the amount of kids that you can have on a bus, um, which will add a little bit to the expense of the uh, winter season because we used to have the boys and girls basketball teams traveling together. Um, now we have to have a separate bus for each one of them. Uh, we won't be able to use the um, the new van this winter for the JV2 level basketball teams that used to travel 14 with a driver. Now we'll have to get a bus for that as well. But um, that's just something we're going to have to deal with um, just to have the opportunity for the kids. And uh, as I said, there's, there's things coming out daily from the MIAA in terms of uh, sport modifications and things like that that uh, whether it's Joe Casey with boys basketball or Bob Romeo with um, uh, girls basketball, Brian McAuliffe with um, hockey, uh, Sue Hunter with swimming, um, all these things. You know, there's just a lot of modifications and changes that are that are going to be evolving even over the next couple of weeks until we start up on December 14th. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. So do we have questions or concerns or thoughts from anybody? Again, please raise your hand. I will start off, Mr. Johnson, because I know the one question, as you commented, was the spectators. And I know last time when we talked about the fall, it was said that it was a Cape Ann League rule, but then everything changed after a 14-day moratorium. So when we're talking about spectators, is it the same sort of thing? Have all Cape Ann League teams agreed? Is it a Cape Ann League rule, or is it just in practice most teams are are adopting no spectator policies. The uh, We had an athletic director's meeting on Wednesday, and I think a lot of athletic directors um, were speaking for their principals um, after a dialogue that they had had. And some are very adamant about not wanting um, spectators in their building. You know, we have it right now where parents aren't allowed in our building. You know, then all of a sudden, you know, you can't come and drop, you know, off something in school, but then you can, you know, but wait till four o'clock and you can come see a basketball game. So I think um, we might have to be a little consistent with that 
and it's not going to be a popular decision. Um, but I think it's something that our focus right now, my focus right now, is how do we get athletics for the kids? Everything else is something we work out as we go along. Yeah, and I, I, I understand. I mean, and, and, and the challenging part also in our town is that we open the schools up only for town meetings. That's where we've had town meetings live in person, but yet we haven't had parents in there at all either. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the one question. And then for, for the live streaming, I know you, you, you mentioned that you installed the camera. Is there any discussion about, I mean, will that be something that anybody can watch? It will be, it will be disseminated to everybody. Uh, will it be something that have you thought about talking to NorCam? Is it a quality of camera that could actually be streamed on NorCam or not? Possibly. And I need a little education myself on that. It's actually a huddle camera. Um, and what you do is you go in and you set up your own huddle account. Then you're, um, uh, when the contests are happening, you can allow access. It's not something where during the day somebody can just, you know, put on the huddle camera and just watch every, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning or noon or whatever. It's like specific times that the games are on is when they're allowed to have access. And every parent or anybody will just have their own account that they would watch on the screen like we're, we're on right now. Mr. Johnson, are the games recorded that they can get them on demand after they stream? You know, that's a very good question. And I'm, I'm going to say I believe so. Um, I know my hello gurus, you know, Chuck Campobasso and Eddie Blum are kind of the guys who I've been kind of, at, you know, talking. And like I said, they just installed the camera today. There are so many applications to this um, that I think it's, I, I'd have to say probably, to be honest with you. It's not, you don't have to watch it live. I think it's something where you can go in and watch it later. Um, so, yes. Great. Any other comments or questions from the committee, from anybody that's listening in at home? Mr. Buckley? Yes, Dr. Dr. Dilley. Dr. Dilley, I'll just say that, you know, one thing about town meeting is that, you know, the buildings were thoroughly cleaned afterwards with a, with a separate cleaning crew. Um, and that's, that's like, you know, something we'd have to keep in mind as well that would make it a little bit different. So, you know, I think, st I, I will just say similar to the fall, you know, things can evolve, we'll keep an eye to it. But right now I think it's, you know, being cautious with um, this. We did check with, you know, our teachers unions as well about that, you know, right now our building's trying to keep every, you know, we're bringing everything inside. And so it's, it's just very different. Even doing town meeting in the summer or in June when you're able to have all your windows open all day and air everything out. I mean, it's, it's very different now. And I think, I think folks, I'm hopeful that folks will understand that. And I'm very glad that we're doing the live streaming um, and we'll, we'll have that installed and we'll be able to practice that a little bit before the season starts. So that'll be good as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Mr. McGowan. Thank you very much, Mr. Buckley. And thank you, Mr. Johnson. I know uh, like with everything else uh, this year, all this takes a lot of extra work and uh, on your part and, and the coach's part and, and uh, um, Ms. Lepret and everybody else, so I appreciate that. I, I, I think that the focus, that the uh, sending a clear message about uh, spectators and, and not having the same hopes as uh, of something happening like this, like it did happen in the fall. And again, if, if it does, that's great. But uh, I think setting those expectations pretty strongly is important so mm -hmm. that people don't feel like they can uh, expect a, a, a relaxing of the rules. Again, if we're able to, that's great. But it's obviously a different situation. But uh, otherwise, um, I'm glad that the, the focus is on getting the kids some playing time. So thank you. Yeah. OK, any other thoughts or comments? If not, my agenda says you would like a vote to presumably approve the moving forward with the winter sports in North Reading. Yeah. I move that the committee vote to uh, approve the uh, plan as described by Mr. Johnson for uh, winter sports in North Reading. Second. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Rich. Aye. Diana. Aye. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes 5 0. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Okay. And by the way, Sophia and Gianna, feel free to drop off if you get bored at any point in time. So don't don't feel you are obligated to stay. But we are honored to have 
I think this is Sako is here. Uh, Gina Sako is uh, Sako is here, and you can't see everybody. Is Mrs. Conan here as well? I am here, Scott. Hi. Hi. Hi, Mrs. Conan. And so I apologize because I'm the reason you had to be here because I opened my big mouth as usual on a meeting and asked some questions. But um, appreciate that you are here to present about student services um, yes. in COVID. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Um, I just, before I get started, I just want to say thank you to the school committee members and also to um, Patrick and Michael Connolly for supporting the recommendation to expand Gina Sacco's role this year. Um, some of you may not know that last year she was the coordinator of elementary special education. And now this year, she has moved into newly a newly expanded role as my assistant director of special education. So that's been just a tremendous asset to our department. And in this year of COVID, this was just the timing couldn't have been better. So thank you, Gina, for all you do. And I just wanted to take a moment to recognize you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and present my screen. I'm just going to shut off my camera while I present and then I'll pop back on for questions. Did you turn off your microphone as well? It might have frozen when she was starting to present. If you need me to share the screen, I can do so as well. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. OK, let me try this. Just want to hit present. Can you see that now? Uh, we, yeah, yep, it's coming up. It oh. was coming up. Oh no, now it just left. Cynthia, would you like me to do this for you? I can do it if it helps. Sure. Why don't we do that, Patrick? Thank you. Yep. It'll just take me one moment to. Yep. Where did it go? Um... Yeah, so Scott, I appreciate you asking the questions because I think, you know, we've talked a lot this year about the hybrid model and what is that. And so I think it will just be good for people to have an understanding of what special education is like in this new framework. So I think it will be helpful. So thank you for asking the questions and giving us the opportunity to come tonight. One moment. I'll be right there. Should be coming up. Yeah, and, and and I and I know many members of the of the committee are interested in this as well. And we had a lot of discussions last year when we went to hybrid about the impact that hybrid would have on some students and the fear that the gap might be growing. And so sure. it's great it's great to kind of you know hear what you're seeing and what's being done. So thank you. Yep. All right, Patrick. So if you want to just go ahead on to the next slide. Okay, so we just want to start by giving you the framework um, and answering the question, what does the provision of special education services look like in a hybrid model of instruction? So there are some things that we are required to do um, by the Department of Education. So we are required to provide services on the student's active IEP. So while we were in hybrid, some services might look different given the nature of being in person as well as being remote. So I talk about this all the time. So in my mind, this statement makes perfect sense to me, but I'm sure some of you might be thinking, what do you mean services might look different? So just to give you a good example of that, if there's a student that receives a service, say four times a week, well, they're only in person three times a week. So one of those services is going to happen virtually. 
So that's an example of how a service happens differently. So it's still the same service, it's the same amount of time, but that one, that one point of contact looks different. So that's what we mean when we say services might look different. So we are required to inform parents in writing of how the services in the IEP are being delivered. So parents should be aware of how, when, and who is providing the services. So this written communication is referred to as the COVID-19 Special Education Learning Plan. So this is the communication that identifies when and how a service is being provided if it is being provided differently. So it's a flexible plan to allow for any changes in the hybrid model so that if all of a sudden something happens and we are fully remote or you know something to that effect, liaisons can go in, update that plan, and send it back out to parents. So it, it's fluid, we can go back to it, we can revisit it, and we can continue to keep that um, communication going with the parents. Um, so COVID-19 learning plans were provided to families earlier this school year. And I would just say, not all students would receive a COVID-19 learning plan. So for example, there are some students for which the services look exactly the same. Pre-K would be a good example of that. Um, but I think it's important that you know we understand that the COVID-19 learning plan is not a change to the IEP. We don't change the IEP. We don't change the services but services might look different. So that is what exactly that means. And that is how we communicate that out through that COVID-19 learning plan. Okay, Patrick, if you can go to the next slide. So this is just very straightforward. This um, was the guidance that was provided to us and provided to districts as we determined cohort C students. So students that were, pri oops, Oh, thank you. Students that were prioritized for in-person learning. Um, and basically, the Department of Ed said, these are the students that you should prioritize. So as I've outlined in the chart, it's pre-K students, homeless students, students in foster care, students duly identified as Eng English learners, um, students who primarily use aided communication, um, students with complex and significant needs. And that determination is actually a mathematical calculation that's determined by the IEP. It's a percentage of services that a student receives. So it's, it's absolutely determined by the IEP. So you look on the IEP page and that's how you find that designation. Um, other students that they also identified are students who cannot engage in remote learning due to their disability related needs or students that had two of the following three. So services are provided outside of the general education classroom as opposed to, for, an exam for example, a student that gets all push in inclusion services. Um, providers are special education teachers and related service providers and special education services constitute more than 75% of the student school day. So that was the information that was given to us by the Department of Ed and sort of set the foundation for how we began to identify cohort C students. You can go on to the next slide, Patrick. So in my opinion, this is the most important slide in my presentation that I, it's important to me that everybody here has an understanding of this. So how do we support struggling students in this model? Because this is really what it's all about. How do we continue to ensure that our students, um, you know, with unique learning needs continue to make progress during this time? So for special education students who are struggling, you know, the appropriate course of action is to reconvene the IEP team with the required members. During the meeting, the team would review the areas of concern and identify appropriate next steps. Um, the decisions that are made here are individualized and tailored to meet the unique needs of the student. And I really, really want to emphasize that the decision making is at the discretion of the IEP team. So I, as the director, can't just override this team process and say, 
this student is going to get A, B, and C. I, I can't do that. That's against the law, against the regulation. There is fidelity in terms of the team process. Um, and it's my job to make sure that that team process and the fidelity associated with that stays intact. Um, in situations where the team is unable to come to consensus, there are options provided by the Department of Ed to assist in facilitating dispute resolution and helping teams come to consensus. So a couple of those options are, um, they will send out somebody to conduct a mediation or they will send somebody out to attend a team meeting. Um, before we would take a, any of these steps, um, you know, our vision for the Student Services Department and Special Education has always been to build in layers so that there are multiple points of contact so that when teams find themselves in a situation where they're struggling to come to consensus, we have in-district options available. So if a liaison chairs an annual review meeting and they can't come to consensus, she can consult with the elementary team chairperson as another person to kind of brainstorm. And, you know, that person might say, oh, have you considered some assessment? Okay. And that might be what helps move that team forward. And then it might be that an administrator might need to be involved. So they might contact the assistant director. So in this way, parents and teams have layers of support available to them because the goal is always to reach consensus, to come to consensus to support the child. Patrick, you can move on to the next slide. So some other considerations that we um, are dealing with this year. So teams are required to assess if there is a need to provide the student with compensatory services as a result of the impact of the school closure. Uh, so again, these decisions are IEP team based and they would utilize data to compare and assess student progress at the time of the closure last spring to present day. So as a result of this data analysis, teams might determine it could be one of three things or it could be a combination of these three or it could be one of these and two other things. Um, they might decide that a student needs to participate in some additional general education supports. So maybe they need to attend a lunch bunch or um, a group with a guidance counselor. They might decide that the student needs um, special education compensatory services. Or they might determine that as a result of the closure, they're, they're seeing something new and there's a new area of suspected disability. So they're going to do updated assessments to explore that, um, which that might result in changes to the IEP. So it could be a combination of those things. It could be one or two of those things. And then again, IEP teams have the discretion to make decisions. So they might come up with a, another creative idea. It might include some parent training. Um, but these are the decisions and the considerations that we have to make as it relates to compensatory services. Patrick, you can go on to the next one. So parent outreach. Parent outreach has been strongly emphasized by the Department of Education, and it makes perfect sense because since the closure, you know, parents have been working with with their children, been on the front lines with them, have seen them, have watched, have, you know, observed the challenges, observed maybe areas of strength, if maybe, you know, being with them much more and seeing them, they're able to see, um, you know, sort of their areas of strengths and areas of growth. So talking with parents right now and getting their feedback around what did it look like in the spring? What are you seeing now? How is the transition going? Those are critical conversations that we need to be having. Um, so we are doing a lot of parent outreach. Um, so around the time that we sent out the COVID-19 learning plan, um, there was outreach that occurred then just to make sure to see if parents had any questions or concerns about that learning plan. Um, and then once progress reports are issued, there'll be another um, There'll be another contact outreach to the parents just to talk about, you know, what are what are you seeing? How do you feel your child is doing? This is what we're seeing based on a progress report. Are there other con concerns that you have that you want to talk about? Do we need to reconvene the team? 
And I just want to say, again, um, this is really an amazing community and parents have partnered with teams, have partnered with teachers and really come together so that we can work together to make student centered decisions. And, you know, we certainly recognize parents right now, you know, managing work, managing having a student home, working remotely, you know, some days going to school, other days, it's a lot. And then if you add on top of that, you know, a child with special education needs, there's a whole nother layer of communication that a parent has to engage in on top of everything else. So I just want to acknowledge that and say how much we appreciate, you know, that all the parents in the community have been so wonderful to work with and have partnered with us. And um, we're very lucky. So if you want to go on to the next one. So if we kind of take all of this and put it together and sort of say, you know, what does all this mean and what can we conclude from this and where are we going and what are we doing? You know, I think we have to say there there is no substitute for in-person learning. So our model includes a combination of in-person services and remote IEP service delivery. We certainly have students who are continuing to reach expected levels of progress within this model. But at the same time, of course, we have students who are struggling to meet their IEP goals. And it's through the combination of parent outreach and following that team process that I described to you earlier, we're supporting students who are struggling and coming up with appropriate next steps. And again, those next steps might include parent training, increasing special education services, or completing updated assessments. Um, this last point here is, again, something Gina and myself are monitoring very closely and doing a lot of check-ins with teachers, but really monitoring for educator burnout. Um, if our teachers are burning out, they're not providing effective delivery of instruction. So it's definitely a priority for us as we move through the school year um, and definitely working to make sure they have the support that they need. And then just, I always just like to remind parents and families, if you have specific questions about your child, it's always best to start with your building-based contacts. Um, those are the people that are most familiar with your child and have all the details. Um, so talking with liaisons or talking with team chairs would be, you know, the place to start. If you have larger questions, procedural questions, um, please always feel free to reach out or myself or to myself or to Gina. So if you have questions for me. Thank you, Mrs. Conant. Um, raise your hand, please, if you guys have any questions. I would just start by saying thank you so much for coming. I mean, I think, I, I don't know, I, I've always been, you know, I try to be as open as I can about this. Like, I mean, I, I have kids that are on IEPs and I just, I mean, I really appreciate the, the work that goes in um, for the people that are helping our students that have special needs. Um, I mean, I met Mrs. Sacco as part of the IEP meetings and, you know, at the little school and, you know, I mean, Mrs. Conant, you've been impressive the whole time. I think it's one of, I, mean, I think North Reading has a lot of great people here, but I mean, I think, I think our special education team is top notch here. And so we're very, very fortunate. Um, yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. The, um, so, uh, so one comment slash question, like, I, well, and then one other comment, which actually might be for Mr. Connolly, just to kind of warn him here. But the first one is with regards to services, like one, one interesting thing, like my daughter gets speech and I know she's doing speech remotely right now. And in one way it's nice because she doesn't get pulled out of class anymore. And I'm just wondering uh, how many of the services are being delivered remotely and have you seen any, any sort of changes in, in that? Because it, it's sort of nice that usually she had to get pulled out of class for something and now it's just, on her remote days, she's doing it. And so she's not pulled out of class at all. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think I think you would find that it varies from student to student. You know, for some students, it might work better. Um, for other students, it's, it's really a struggle. You know, a, a lot of that depends upon where the child is at developmentally, what's the nature of the disability, their profile. Um, but certainly, you know, I think as with anything, it's, it's going to work for some and then for others, it's going to be a struggle. Um, and then, 
and uh, Sako, are you going to yeah, say something? I was just going to add one of the things that I know that providers uh, sit a lot through the closure back in the spring, but now as well as having those opportunities to work remotely with the students gave them a lot more opportunity to interact with families. So the connections with the parents and the understanding and the ability to ask questions sort of on the fly in the middle of a session, or can you tell me how you do this? Why that's happening? How can I carry that over at home? So there was there was a, a strong sense of community, more so than there already is. We have fantastic families in this district, but if we were to look at one of the silver linings to all of this, I would say that during those remote sessions, it did provide opportunities for more interaction than we would normally have when the students are coming to school to receive the services. Excellent point. And I'll get to Rich in one second. The, my, my funding question was, I, I, I expect that there's probably some additional, you know, services that are being needed here or there, but do we know our, the, the funds that we have for COVID, you know, these like one-time funds, are they able to be used for uh, special education services as well? I presume yes, but I'm not sure. Yeah, so they, they can be structured in such a way that perhaps you're structuring them for stipends, for example, for somebody to provide um, compensatory services. Um, you know, Michael Connolly and I meet on an ongoing basis to kind of talk about what's changing, what am I seeing, what, you know, what might we anticipate. And as you know, with special education, it's very difficult to predict. You know, we could have a, a student move into our district tomorrow who has a residential placement on their IEP, and that's a cost that we didn't see coming and we couldn't plan for. Um, but because Michael Connolly and I are in such ongoing communication, you know, we're able to kind of to the best that we can kind of have an idea of, okay, I, I'm thinking this is where we're going to want to put the funds. We want to be thinking about compensatory services. We want to be thinking about these services that students might need, you know, as we move through the year and into next year. And then Mr. Buckley, hi, this is Michael Connolly. Thank you, Ms. Conant. So, uh, and then to answer your question, so I think the, we certainly could um, make them available through the, the COVID funding through this, some of our federal sources. Um, if it can specifically be um, the result of a situation due to COVID that was unpredicted and unbudgeted, then it would be an acceptable, allowable expense. Thank you very much. Mr. McGowan, you have your hand up. Yes, thanks. Um, so I was curious, you know, were were any of the students, did any parents have to make a choice to to, to keep their children uh, at home, basically in cohort D uh, that were, you know, had previously been, uh, obviously that would have been a terrible choice to, to have to make, but uh, um, uh, th that had been receiving services? Um, I think that we had a couple of parents opt for cohort D, but of their own volition due to concerns around having their child in school, um, you know, without yep. saying too much. Um, yep, understood. Yeah, those were the circumstances under which, you know, I did see a little bit of that. Yeah. And the teams are continuing to work with families in those situations and offering any possible option for in-person service that families are comfortable with. So it, it really, it is student specific, but there's ongoing communication between whether families are coming to pick up materials, whether they're choosing to access some in-person services. It's really just dependent upon the um, comfort levels of the families, but the communication is consistent with families in cohort D as it would be with the students that are in person. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions? Well, we very much appreciate you coming and updating us and it's good to hear what's going on and wish you all the best, Dr. Thank Daly. You. Thank you. It's a wonderful presentation and thank you so much for all that you both do and all the support that you give me. Um, I'm so glad that Gina was able to be officially recognized tonight. That was a great, um, presentation, Cynthia and Gina, and you guys are doing a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. And for everybody here, it gets even less exciting going forward. We have policies now. So and I actually have to step off out for a second here, but uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. McGowan to please sort of talk about uh, the policies. Actually, are you on the, no, it's uh, it's Chris and, and Janine. So actually, Janine or Chris, if you guys can kind of run us through the policies that we need to vote on tonight. Janine, why don't you go ahead? Uh, sorry, um, I had to get to my unmuting. Um, the policies that we were discussing um, last time was the policy set forth by the state. Um, uh, oh, we're on this one first, sorry. Um, is this the one, Patrick, that's rewritten? This would be ABBA, yep. Okay. All right. So the, the state set forward one file called AC and we did a first reading um, last uh, meeting and um, it basically replaces all of our non-discrimination and harassment, be it student or staff. So um, just a little bit of background. There's a lot of different um, policies that it's going to replace, but we're going to rename it um, ABBA in lieu of AC. Um, I need to just get to everything. Um, it's, it's, for lack of a better word, it's a blanket policy that covers um, non-discrimination and harassment of any kind, be it to a student or to a staff member. And um, through legal counsel, we found it best to um, change it from the AC to uh, reflect better our policy um, lettering. So uh, in discussion, we found that it was best to do the ABBA. And that's kind of the long and short of it. And, and so are we also uh, effectively eliminating those other policies that were basically repeats of the same policy, GAAA, -A -A, yes. JCA, and JCAD? Exactly, yep. yes. Correct. So all those documents are included here in the pack. So AB, the old ABBA and GAAA, so I'm scrolling through them. So what? Yeah. Yep. JCAD. So I wonder if, are, are you going to replace those other policies with just copies or we're just going to eliminate, eliminate those uh, completely? They will, the, the G, yep. I'm sorry, with copies, is that what you said? Well, yeah, so I guess just, just to restate what I said, so we're basically eliminating completely GAAA, JCA, and JCAD. Correct. They'll yeah. remain in the policy okay. manual with an asterisk next to them, I believe is the way that we notate that. Um, to preserve the history of their existence, um, but that, and this document at the bottom will note that it replaces all those documents as well. So there'll be a, a cross-reference in that, I believe, is how it's been done. So I guess my question is, and I, I'm not too uh, concerned about it, but should we have a first reading of uh, a a motion on those three policies. We should. We can definitely have a second reading on this on the on the main policy ABBA, which is which we we will note that you know as amended and and renamed as ABBA from AC is what we uh, voted on last Correct. time. Yes. Do do um, we need to? Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, yes. Yes. We do. We need to make a motion to delete or remove um, the other ones, the, the, text G, of, the text of, yeah. Yes, because right. it will be condensed under the ABBA. So I would recommend that we do that for those three policies as a first reading that, that we can then tie out next time. That sounds, that it, sounds very good. Um, do we do a first reading for a removal? I, I don't think that we would need I guess, to. I think I it guess, would just be I, a matter of 
if ABBA is going to replace all of them. So you would need a motion to accept ABBA's new reading as a second um, reading. And then you'd need to make a motion to um, remove the GAAA, JCA, and JCAD. Because we're not making a reading on them, we're just removing them because they're no, it's redundant. I'm, I'm, you know, if everyone feels strongly in that direction, that's fine too. I, I, I think if we're voting on, on, you know, changing a parent conference night, then we probably should vote on, you know, stick to the strict rules on, on changing policies. But um, that's just my opinion. What do you mean by changing the policy? We're not the the well, we're, ABBA we are is being we're effectively changing GAAA and JCA and JCAD by zeroing them out, if you will. Why why don't why don't we have one motion for a first reading to accept and to delete? So we have a motion, a first reading to accept the one policy and to remove policies, you know, A, B, and C. Yeah, and just to clarify, the last meeting I was more concerned with the urgency of doing it that night as a first reading, but I feel it's more complete tonight. So if, if everyone's more comfortable doing this as a first reading then, and then finalizing it next meeting, if that kind of appeases everyone, then, then that could work as well. That's fine. Rich and Janine, do you feel comfortable doing that together? Since since the one is replacing the other, we do it as a, a as a first reading to accept well, one motion and to remove all as one and to remove and to replace the other motions or to remove them. All right, oh, I, Scott, I have two things. Yes, um, it's Janine, by the way. When we I, did those like two hundred things with uh, then John Bernard. Um, I don't believe that we did a reading to remove. It was just, it was I can't just remember. a removal. I can't, I can't remember if we got rid of any, though. Yeah, we did. We might have done a motion, but. Yeah, but it, was I, it a motion to read it once and then the second time it was removed, or was it just a motion to simply remove? Well, I don't even remember that what, what we removed, so I, I don't think my memory <laughs> on that, on that one. All right, and then the second thing um, is, I was going to get to it on the minutes, but when we did the motion to accept on the first reading, um, I had said that it was labeled as AC, but to be relabeled to comply with our current policy lettering. So I believe once that gets amended in the minutes that we should be okay just to call it AB. A B B B A. We shouldn't have to do a uh, first reading tonight and then a second reading again. Does, does that make sense? Yes, but we're going to have to do a second reading of some of them. So I think maybe the easiest way to do this would be to do two motions, both of, both of the first reading, one of them on each topic, which will have kind of a couple of components to it. So we're going to, you know, accept one motion and remove some other motions on each topic. And we do one reading today and then a second reading next time. All right. So then the, the, uh, the motion that we made last meeting is redundant. Yes. Okay. So then I won't make her amend it. How's that? <laughs> I mean, I'm all for okay. Cindy. Doing, I'm all for Cindy doing some work. So, well, she has a little <laughs> bit of work to do. I found one other thing. So, Actually, yeah. So anyway, all right, cool. So, Janine, um, do you want to do you want to make the motions? Do you feel? I mean, do you want to make the motions now? Oh uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so first, I'll make a motion to accept the non-discrimination and harassment, formerly known as AC, to be made into policy ABBA and replace the old. A B B A policy. I second. Okay. Any comment or discussion on this one? Okay. We'll do a roll call vote. Janine. Aye. Chris. Aye. Rich. Aye. Diana. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes five zero.
Thank and you. this was the first reading. Did I state yeah. that? And I don't first, think I stated it, but anyway, for as the first reading. All right. Um, following that, as a first reading to eliminate um, the following policies, G-A-A-A, J-C-A, and J-C-A-D, as they are redundant towards the A-B-B-A, and I believe is noted on the A-B-B-A. Mr. Buckley? Yes, Dr. Daly. Would you also want to eliminate the old ABBA? Did we do that in the last one? No. The way Janine phrased it was that we're rewriting, this is now ABBA. It's right. Okay, so that was in that first motion, and then this motion is the other three. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yep. Correct, if I was following along. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. I, I second the motion. Okay. I usually follow along. I just can't say anyone's name. So we'll do a roll call vote again. <laughs> Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well. We get to do the whole thing again next, next time. Yay. We get to do the whole thing again right now, essentially, because it's very similar. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's split into two, right? I don't know if Janine or Chris want to take this. Yep. As well. Chris, do you want me to keep going or you want to take you're, this one? You're on a roll, Janine. I'm on a roll. All right. Um, following the ABBA policy, the procedure um, will also be needed to replace by two... Uh, grievance procedures. The first one, this is more of an explanation and not yet the motion, so please bear with me. Um, just like ABBA had a, a, a dash R and as did the J, sorry, GAAA dash R, JCA dash R, and JCAD dash R. Um, the dash R is the procedure that goes with it. Um, the state has so also sent the Title IX sexual harassment and grievance procedure and the civil rights grievance procedure, which is anything that has nothing to do with Title IX, any other kind of harassment. So we need to um, accept these as the procedure to the ABBA. Does that make sense? Yes. Why don't you make okay. a motion, Janine, and we'll just second it. Okay, and then after that motion is done, then we'll need to make a motion to uh, resend or, you know, eliminate the other letters with the dash R. So I will make a motion for a first reading to accept. Um, I'll go with the civil rights grievance procedure as ABBA. Oh, am I right? ABBAR dash one. We did, yeah, yeah BBA dash R1 and dash R2. Okay, I, I thought we would do them separate. Okay, yep. Okay, um, so as a first reading for ABBA dash R, which is the civil rights grievance, grievance procedure. Dash R1, right? Oh, I'm sorry, R1. Oh. I just, thank you for that clarification. I second. Okay, any discussion? Do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well. And Janine, you're still on a roll. All right. Um, I make a motion to accept for first reading the Title IX Sexual Harassment Grievance Procedure to be named ABBA-R2. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Passes by zero. Is that all of them? Okay. Yeah, we've got one more to do. Oh, yes, one more. Yes. I make a motion to 
eliminate the following policies. Um, GAA, as a first reading, sorry, GAAA-R, JCA-R, and jcad as they are redundant to the ABBA R1 and ABBA R2. I second. Any discussion on this one? And we did the other ones that are listed on here already. They were the last ones. They were the other three we did, correct? Well, yeah. well no, I think we still have to do ABBA R, correct? Oh, yes. Oh. Sorry. Good. Good point. Oh, uh, well, no. Mm, that's the one I that guess I should. those two are replacing that one. And then we're exactly. all in BAA, GC. The last two that are on here, something we'll take up at a later time. There's two others as well, but we're going to just delay those a little bit. Yes. Um, I will then add in, sorry about that. I forgot about um, to add in the ABBA-R as well. Do we men? Amend the motion. Chris, do you second the amended motion? Um, there wasn't a second, so I just corrected my motion to include the ABBA-R. Right. I second the current motion. Correct. Okay. And we will take a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well. 5-0. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Buckley? Yes. There was a recommendation from legal counsel that these, um, that, we, that we also adopt the policy, I'm sorry, the procedures, which are the R's, um, to be reviewed by the superintendent. And, and, and those, they can be updated without having to go to full reading. If I need to update them to change, there's a lot of details in the procedures about the names, email addresses of the people who are in the various roles. And so the recommendation is to have the superintendent be able to review and revise these um, procedures. These are not actually policies, they're procedures. And they don't need to go through the full process of first and second readings, is my understanding. Janine, correct. I, I it the same way? Yes. I believe that's um, been a you, practice in the past, hasn't it? It has been. But I, if you read the fourth paragraph of the non discrimination and harassment, which is now the new ABBBA, um, it states the superintendent shall adopt and publish one or more grievance procedures for addressing the reports and discrimination, harassment and retaliation, blah, 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 of the policy. So in the policy itself, it's stating that the superintendent is the one that has to do it. So if we just accepted that, that policy, which says that that's what needs to be done. Do we need a second uh, motion on this then? No, it's just in the wording of the policy. And I know that in the past that when there is a change on a procedure, that it is usually it's come across the school committee. Um, but only if it's like a, a large change, if it's just a, a name change because of the employee has changed. Um, then I think it was just a revised, and it was noted that it was revi revised on that day, on such I, a day. Yeah, I, I would suggest that I don't know that they're always even updated that way. When it, when it's chain when changes are made to dates or to names, I don't know that those are always updated that way. I think that you may have done this when you updated every single policy in the thing where you read them all, but I don't think when when the when the procedures are routinely updated, they, they get brought forth. I don't think that happens. I just, just to clarify, I'm saying that I'm perfectly fine. I don't think we need to take a vote on this. You're, you're perfectly free to, especially since we, it, it is part of this policy that you're, 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 you can do that now. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that was clear because I, I just, yeah. want, you know, especially these now they're so complicated. It's more than just yep. naming uh, the Title IX coordinator. Now you're naming basically every role. So every time anything changes, including, um, quite honestly, back to the principal announced, but I have to go in and change it as soon as I do that. So yep. this is challenging. So. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, think, I think it's clear in there. And I think, I mean, end of the day, 
when we're not making substantive changes, when we're changing names out, um, or I mean, even with the law, I mean, most of the time we, we reference the laws. And so if the laws change, I would say many of them auto automatically change because the reference is to the same law if the law, get, law gets amended. And usually when, when a law is amended, there's just small things that are added. You know, particular classes may be adjust, adjusted. So yeah, I, I think we're fine since it's in the policy already that it gives Dr. Daly the power. No, thank you very much. This is my first time to this as superintendent, so I just wanted to make sure it was clear. So thank yeah. you. Um, okay, I probably should have brought the next pot topic up before this, um, but the bachelor principal update, because I do, do know there's some parents still on here. Um, Dr. Daly, would you like to give an update on the bachelor principal search? Yeah, or principal search? Thank you so much. I would like to just thank our uh, our committee, we had a, a wonderful committee. Diana Boutwell was a member of that committee. Um, we had um, two parent representatives. Um, we had Miss Buston from the um, from the CPAC. We also had Miss Fleming, who's a paraprofessional, who's also a parent. We had Carrie Eichmann, who's a parent at the Bachelor School. Miss Caroline Kane and Miss Lori Johnson, who were teachers. And we also had um, Dr. Daniel Downs. Uh, Director of Digital Learning, Christine Molly, who's the principal. And it was um, an incredible group of, of um, folks that came together to review the questions. We interviewed three folks on Monday. And at this time, I'm um, happy to put forward the name of Mr. Michael Maloney, who's the assistant principal at the middle school, as the interim principal for the Batchelder School. And so we're very um, excited for Mr. Maloney. He did a wonderful job. He's worked in this district for over 10 years and he's absolutely earned um, the respect of all of the staff of the middle school, the parents and families of the middle school, as well as the administration. He's done much more than just the middle school. He's also uh, been very involved and I'm sure he's presented with you over the years for school safety. He's really taken the lead on the school safety team, the district safety and the ALICE program and presented to students of all ages um, the, the ALICE safety program at all schools. So he's a familiar face in the Bachelor School and we think it's a great opportunity for him to be able to experience um, leadership as a new level. He's been an assistant for many years, uh, for 10 years, but he is now ready to be a principal and to do that in an interim way with the veteran principal like Mr. Colleen, not too far away, I think is a great opportunity for growth for Mr. Um, Maloney. And so, as I said to the committee, it's, you know, no matter what happens, we will certainly do a full search in the spring. I think that that is the best interest of the school and the district and Mr. Maloney as well. Um, but this is a great opportunity and he would be eligible to apply for the full position in the spring if he's so interested. And so I, I want to congratulate him. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Excellent. Congratulations to Mr. Maloney. The, my, my only question would be, well, so every time one position gets filled, we have another vacancy. So yep. can you talk a little bit about the vacancy at the middle school now? Absolutely. And so I've been uh, working closely with Dr. O'Connell on this, and she absolutely um, supports uh, this this decision. But of course, it's, it's bittersweet. She's losing a partner that she's worked so closely with for, for a decade. And also it's not ideal timing, right? To do this in the middle of a year and especially this year where it's very challenging. Um, so, but I have given her all assurances that the transition will be smooth. Um, Mr. Colleen and, and I will continue to, to work in, you know, I'll continue to do assistant superintendent, which will allow Mr. Colleen to do bachelor things while Mr. Maloney transitions while Kathy posts um, for his replacement. And that, um, you know, we, we're ready to go with the posting tomorrow. We've already met today. And we are hopeful that you know, Mr. Maloney will be official on, de on December 1st, and he'll be able to be present at the Batchelder and get to meet everyone. But we will not fully transition out of his middle school role until we've comfortably filled in all of the needs elsewhere. So we're very, you know, we've been doing this with, with Mr. Clean for several months, and we'll continue that for a little bit longer to make sure that all the, the um, supports are in place. Excellent. I don't know if Ms. Boutwell has any comments or thoughts on it as well. No, I think the process went smoothly. And, um, you know, I think it's great that 
Michael Maloney is going to be stepping into this role and we're excited about that. And obviously <coughs> huge, huge shoes to fill, but um, I know he'll be successful and it's great to have somebody within the district moving into the role. And, and, and to be clear, so for you, you said that there was three people that interviewed, were they both internal and external? There was, there was another internal candidate and there was another uh, external candidate. The internal candidate is a is currently a, a teacher that's looking aspiring administrator, and the external candidate was a um, was a current he'd uh, been a principal for many years. So we, we saw a, a nice range of experience there, and an up and comer, and internal as an external, and we felt that we had uh, a, a good pool to look at to determine what was the best fit for this um, for this interim role. Good. Yeah, just just to point out that we were we did a. Uh look externally as well then. We do. Uh, I just want to uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Maloney. It's a great choice. I, I, uh, I'm excited that he's going into this role, role. And even though he got my son in trouble the first year, my son was in middle school. I won't, I never, I have never held that against him. So I'm really glad that he's uh, going into this role. Uh, and I think it was a great choice for, for, uh, for everyone. Great. And I, I or maybe, or, or or maybe he didn't get my son in trouble. Maybe I said that wrong. Maybe my son got in trouble, and and but uh, <laughs> you know, it just depends on how you look at it. Um. And I was just going to say, I didn't specifically tell Mr. Maloney to join us tonight, um, but I, I will certainly bring him uh, to the next meeting to, to introduce him, and uh, he's going he to there. sharing of the news with the community probably later this evening to share it with the middle school, because at this point, you know, we didn't name finalists, so it wasn't even very clear uh, that, that, that he was even moving for this role, being an interim, so. Okay, Mrs. Imbriano. Um, is my mic still on? Yeah, it is. Yes. Cool. Um, this is uh, for Patrick. Is he, he's the interim, right? Correct. Now, will he have to reapply um to for the permanent position he would yeah we've we've made that uh part of the process and i think it's uh, quite honestly similar to the process i went through i think it's a healthy process to to look through um that um you know certainly if he's successful as the interim that will certainly be uh helpful but i think you know so much could be different in, in the spring i think it's important for all of us to um you know to go through that process together so Okay. We, haven't learned, we haven't learned our lesson after hiring you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, and, and that's in all the candidates were aware of that piece of it, you know, with the timeline and everything as it, as it went through. So, um, but we can discuss all of that as, as that emerges. It's, we have a few months to, uh, to begin that process. I believe later February is when we outlined to begin those conversations. Yeah. O only other thought that I would have would be, I think it's great to, this district has had a history of trying to help people move up and, you know, try to achieve their, you know, their long-term dreams. And you, you mentioned that there was an internal candidate beyond just Mr. Maloney. And so I think it'd be really important that we make sure that we provide feedback to that teacher about, you know, ways to improve, things that were strong because, you know, I think it's I think it's really a, a, a great thing in North Reading that we really support people, you know, their their career paths. And so that we, um, you know, really make sure to give some some feedback so that they can, you know, well, we never want to lose anybody so that they can continue yeah. to uh, progress in their careers. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I um, personally gave feedback and offered my services for um, for continued support. But. Um, without getting specific, obviously and identifiable, you know that the the other candidates were great, and our internal candidate, especially, um, had had a lot of positive feedback from the committee, and I've passed that on. So it was very, um, it's a good experience. I, I'm not sure if I mentioned as well that I believe that we're going to be posting an, an interim position for the middle school principal, assistant principal as well, that will get us from now until the end of the year, and then again in the spring we'll we'll reassess that long term as well because we want to get some folks in um, in place um, for the middle school. Great. I saw Mrs. I saw Janine's hand go down and then back up. So Janine, do you have another yeah. comment? Um, not in regards to this, so if you guys don't mind indulging me a second. Um, 
the Title IX of Education Amendment of 1972. We did a first reading on November 5th, and we don't, we, sorry, did not do a second reading today. So I, do we want to quit, put that in so that that one is settled? It's for the handbook, it's not a policy. Uh, sure. I mean, Dr. Daly, do we, should we put that into the handbook? Do you want to do that or do you want to do? So is the handbook title line handbook? Yeah, it's the, well, it's the handbook language, right? Yeah. Yes. The language for the handbook. So yeah, we could do a second reading of the handbook language tonight. Yeah. Okay. Do we, do, do we, do we usually do that? I, I mean, that's fine. I, I, we, we can do that. Go ahead, Janine. Why don't you make a motion? Yeah. Well, we did a first reading, so I'm assuming we should do a second one. I've not yeah, in the past done anything for a handbook before, but I'm assuming because it's a pretty big change that that's why it's yeah. presented. Yeah, I think it's typical that, the, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, the handbooks are presented to you and you vote on the handbooks. So this would be yeah. a method to the handbooks that we'd be inserting. So maybe it's not two readings that's required, but since we posed it that way, maybe we um, we do it this way tonight, and then I... I will chalk this up to my learning. So I appreciate the feedback. So yes or no? Go ahead. For, we, okay. The first, the first one said first. So if it said first, we should probably do a second. Well, that was kind of my thinking. And Cindy, please yep. bear with me because um, I'm going to have to make you amend it on the fifth just because it says it's policy and it should be for handbook. So but, uh, I make a motion to accept for as a second reading, the Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972 to update the handbook. Aye, right, second. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none, Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an aye as well, five zero. Thank you, Janine. You're welcome. Okay. It's the Janine show. We're going to minutes now. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. I make a motion to accept the October 19th open session uh, minutes as written. I'll second. So on discussion, the only one thing that I think should poss possibly be added under, I think, under administrative report, we mentioned that we talked about the potential changes to the Thanksgiving um, schedule the, uh, the days before Thanksgiving. We did bring that up at two different meetings. I believe this was the first meeting that it came up as part of the administrative report. I think Dr. Daly had reported on doing his listening tours and this came up as an idea. We then put it on the next agenda. And so I know some community members had asked about the notice and I believe this was a meeting that it came up first at. And if so, I think we should just note that as part of the administrative report that Dr. Daly reported on that idea. I don't know what other people think. You know, first and foremost, am I correct that that's the right meeting? It is the right meeting. I, I'm trying to remember whether it was part of the reopening or <coughs> it was part of the administrative report. I can't remember, honestly. I can go back and check the tape. I, I would have said it was part of the reopening statement at the beginning. Yeah. I thought you put it at the end for some reason. I yeah. thought it just—I thought it was an idea that came up at the end, but was it part of the reopening? I thought it was, but I can double check the, um, the you know the the, the recording, <laughs> and we can amend those uh, minutes for the. We, it, it, if you think it's part of the reopening, I'm fine to just put it as part of the reopening. They, they should put it there. Yep. No, no, no extra work needed. Um, okay, so I would I would try to amend amend. Just have that amendment to the minutes to note it in there. Janine, you made the motion. Are you okay? To put it under the opening up or the reopening update so that Correct. it was known Just, that it was a discuss. That's fine. Right. Okay. So, so the motion now is as amended. As amended. So. And the second is first. as amended. And we have a second as amended. Correct. Who was the second, Chris or? Yeah, Rich. Rich. Okay, Rich. so well, we have the motion, we have the second. So, do a roll call vote. Janine, aye. Rich, aye. Chris, aye. Diana, aye. And I'm an aye as well. Passes five zero. Thank you all.
Third. Janine, November 5th. Okay, I make a motion to accept the November 5th um, open session meetings with an amendment to simply swatch out the word policy to handbook under D3, the first reading policies for the Title IX of Education Amendments of 1972. I second. Okay, any discussion on this one? We'll do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. Chris? Aye. Diana? Abstain. Oh, yes, I forgot you weren't here for that one. So, um, and then I'm an I as well, so passes 4 0. Thank you very much. Um, I, Chris, uh, sorry, not Chris, Scott. I have a, oh. a question. I see that there's a couple other people on here, except for, you know, instead of just the five of us, six of us. So I didn't know if it would be worth mentioning um, Rich's part of the donation and bids because of last time there was a gener very generous donation by the Shang family in Sometimes we like ask them to come in, but I just thought because, like I said, there's some other people out there that it might be worth noting again. Sure. So I, I yeah, I think it's important for folks who are on here to know that every week, every uh, meeting, we have uh, uh, bids and donations that we're very happy to acknowledge from our most generous community here. Um, and um, Janine's right that last week, their last meeting, there was some very, a couple of very generous donations from that family and. Uh, uh, I think they were, um, they're probably mentioned in those minutes, uh, um, and, uh, they, they were particularly generous, but, uh, you know, we are fortunate to live in a very generous community who are, and we have these, these, uh, acknowledgements every meeting. So thanks to the community. Okay. Thank you very much. And go yep. ahead. No, go ahead, Rich. And, and am I next now on the, well, we've no, no budget update. No staffing, correct, Mr. Connolly and, and Dr. Daly? Correct. Okay. Correct. Let me go to the bids and donations. And so as an example, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $5,000 from the E. Ethel Little PTO to fund the purchase of technology equipment, including three mobile TV floor stands and three smart board interactive display units at the Little School. I'll second. Uh, only discussion is it's, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to have PTOs that can fill in the gaps that we can't get in the budget. So thank you to everybody for a roll call vote. We'll do Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Diana. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm an I as well. Five zero. Thank you. That's the only one I don't have in front of me. Yes. Um, yes, that was it. Yep. Subcommittee updates. So policy subcommittee, uh, Janine or Chris? We pretty much yeah. discussed everything that was discussed. So um, <laughs> unless you, uh, there are a couple more that will be in the pipeline coming shortly, but we need a little bit more time to uh, review it. I think Diana has been messaging saying she would like to talk a little bit more about policies tonight. I would. I would. <laughs> Um, athletic subcommittee. Well, if you want, I can I can go off for another five minutes if you like. <laughs> Keep it going, Rich, please. <laughs> athletic subcommittee, Janine and Diana. You want to take this one? Sure. Um, the presentation that you saw tonight was probably the brunt of our discussion around winter sports, so I don't need to rehash that, but just kind of getting feedback from the athletic subcommittee on that presentation and details. Um, and then there was just a, a general discussion around the facilities and um, the need for th the facilities post Thanksgiving um, and just trying to align the usage of facilities around some of the, you know, the odd scheduling that we have around sports this time around. Um, so I think that, you know, things such as the, the lights for um, the field are typically off on a certain period of time. And now we might have to look into the cost of running those lights from February to April for various purposes. So just things like that, nothing too um, substantial. I don't know if there's anything else that uh, I missed, but those were the two big ones that I made note of. 
No, that's pretty much it. I actually got in like a minute or two late, so I didn't catch all of the, I caught the tail end of the, uh, the fields and the lights and all that kind of stuff. That's why I deferred to you. Okay. Uh, fine art subcommittee, Matt, Chris or, uh, Reg. Yeah. You want me to go? You want to go? Um, well, um, I, I, I'll say we, we, we spent a lot of the time, um, chatting about, um, a plan that the performing arts, uh, staff been putting together uh, to coordinate because there are, you know, as I, I was struck as they were talking at as complicated as I, I come away from any conversation thinking that uh, that COVID is for teachers and students to navigate. It's like um, hearing them talk about how in planning a chorus class in the time of COVID, you have to not only juggle how, how much faster things spread when singing, but the rate of the airflow, how often the machines kick in and recycle air, and then how to navigate lining up time for kids to sing with sufficient time for the room to replenish its air, and a lot for when the machine will kick on during a 70 minute period. And just that these are the factors they need to figure out to then give kids as much uptime and come out of it thinking that the kids will still end up getting to sing roughly as much time as they would have in a quote unquote regular class from a year ago. I, it was just astounding, it kind of put in perspective to me just how tricky it is for, for everybody involved and particularly for people whose activities, you know, um, are rendered more dangerous with COVID. Uh, so that was, you know, a big takeaway for me, but um, I had to jump out a little bit early. So, Rich, if you want to fill in the, the latter part. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, you know, uh, chime in on that as well. I mean, they, they have basically produced what is at the moment a, a, a seven page draft uh, of a plan that is in its own way as detailed as our reopening plan, smaller in scope, but uh, still just as detailed. Uh, and it, it is pretty impressive and the amount, of, the amount of thought that goes into it. Um, and I think the other key uh, thing that was discussed was, um, and Dr. Daly, you can chime in on this, was uh, efforts to um, uh, uh, Get, get some in-person or some uh, some face-to-face -face instruction with uh, with students who are uh, uh, fully remote. Would you agree that that was the other part of the big part of the discussion, Dr. Daly? Yes, absolutely. So this is something that you know our schedule, the way our schedule is set up, and the way our elementary specialists are set up, they are currently not able to provide live instruction to the students that are fully and remote. So at the secondary level, there is some live instruction provided, um, but the way it's been uh, done at the elementary school, it's not, it has not been possible to date. We're actually going to be able to do some of that next week during the, the fully remote days because those specialist teachers now are going to be able to just address all the students at once. Um, but it, it's quite challenging with the elementary age students to be, to be leading them outside in the phys ed exercise and also talking to a camera. I mean, so it just was logistically challenging and there's just been the, the, the numbers, the elementary specialists have taken on a tremendous amount this year. And so our, our curriculum leaders at the secondary level have just asked me today if they can get some time to go down and shadow them to help try to troubleshoot some ways to do things a little bit more efficiently. But what we're really trying to think about is some outside of the box ways to free up some folks or to get some folks on their um, at some alternative times to be able to provide some connections for students at home. Um, it might not be, you know, it might be a grade level. It might be across the district, you know, where, where someone's doing K and one art. Um, so the students are getting curriculum. They're just getting um, PowerPoints record, pre-recorded type of lessons and assignments that they're able to do for their specials. So this would be an opportunity for that. So I have received some correspondence from um, families in the, in the remote cohorts that are really looking for that connection because for some kids, as we know, um, what motivates them for school are the arts and the phys ed and the specialist classes. And so we really want to try to make that happen. So that was discussed. And then certainly they did a tremendous job with this plan. And then just trying to find the locations of um, where they can have jazz band inside. They are still having some classes outside. They could come inside and do something very different. They could do more music theory, more, more written work. Um, but obviously, knowing our folks, they, they want to make sure that they're providing the same opportunities that students would have in a typical year. So that means bigger spaces, spreading out to 10 feet, all the, all the um, other considerations that were mentioned earlier about airflow and, and droplets and 
Um, they are doing a fantastic job of keeping up with what's current, uh, checking in with what's coming out of the Massachusetts department, but also through all of their music and performing arts um, channels as well. So it was really, it was really a, a pretty thorough presentation and meeting, and we have some really good plans in place. And I did discuss it with the administrators today to help find that space and get everybody inside. It was, we've had good luck with the weather um, this year, being able to be outside. And if you have seen, it, it's phenomenal to see the full band outside or, or Miss Lister's classes or all these different classes um, outside. I will note also that this week, I've been able to observe um, remotely and sort of go into the classes the way that the students are going in remotely. So I, I was able to observe a piano class of Miss Kane's. I was able to observe Mr. Dexter's art class um, and another video production class. So at least those three classes um, from the remote angle, seeing it exactly as the students see it at the secondary level. And it's, it's pretty incredible the way they've just, you know, envisioned using all their creative skills to really come up with a way to, um, to keep the students engaged remotely and in person. So it's pretty impressive. So. Nice. Thank you very much. Mrs. Imbriano, you have your hand up. Oh, I just forgot to shut it off, <laughs> sorry. Just checking. Um, okay, subcommittee uh, schedule. We just have one on the board, which is finance planning team, December 1st at 8 a.m. Administrative report, Dr. Daly. Just a few items of note. I did want to note about the, uh, the the notorious group being selected for the two different competitions. I believe that was discussed and covered earlier. But, um, that was very exciting news that Ms. Kane shared with us also at the meeting yesterday. And this plaque came, I discussed in the spring, I believe, about Ms. Uh, Whitney Cleary was a, was a semifinalist for Teacher of the Year for 2021. And uh, we're very proud of, of Ms. Cleary and her great work that she's done as a curriculum leader and as a science teacher at the Hood School. So Dr. McKay was very proud to share this, as was Ms. Cleary. So I just thought I'd take a moment to recognize her great achievement. Wonderful. Yeah, I may, may even have her come and, and say a few words in the future, actually. This is, this is a truly remarkable honor um, to be a semifinalist. Um, for this for this award, and this is not the first time she's made it that far. So she's um, she's she's a phenomenal teacher at the Hood School, as are uh, many others. But it's really great to see our, our teachers being recognized this way. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, correspondence, Dr. Daly. So I just wanted to share um, the. I, I'm not sure, Mr. Buckley, the way to do it. I shared with you about the the typical. Um, uh, the land information that needs to be shared and, and, and discussed. Is that something that I would present at this in this way? Um, not usually. It was just, I, th I think it was just there. The town was looking for comments on some changes to public land. And so if anybody wants to, I mean, I, I think maybe you can just send it around so people can look at the letter. If anybody has any comments, is it, I looked it up. Is that like over by where the town hall is right now? Is that the town hall land? Yeah, it's 239 North Street. Um, so I will I will just disseminate that if there's anyone that wants. I, we do have to make reviews to that no later than December 4th. So I guess if if there's something urgent that needs to be discussed, we could have another uh, meeting before the, the scheduled meeting. I mean, I don't, think, I don't think there was anything that impacted yeah. us in there. Yeah. I, it, yeah. it doesn't seem to. It seems routine, but... Again, my first time through, I just wanted to make sure that um, that we did it. So, yeah, I think it was just uh, you know everybody in town got you know town officials got um, or, or, or town town employees or whoever whoever got the comment on it, and so I don't think there's anything. What is that it? Two thirty nine. Yes. Yeah, there's nothing there. It's just a little part. There's no there's no school around there. There's just. And it was just talking about like cutting back trees and the visual lines and yeah, yeah it's storm water. Storm water. I'll, I'll share it around for for folks to view. And if there's anything, we can we can discuss it um, if needed. Could could also even be that I don't even know if it was that we were doing changes or they were doing changes, and there could have been a, an abutter that was doing something, and we were in a butter on this one. But I don't think there's anything there. Only other correspondence was a number of parents had reached out about the Thanksgiving remote days and. I think we all saw some of those emails and you know, we responded and had the parent forum. So 
Okay, future business. So our next meeting is going to be Thursday, December 10th at 6.30 p.m. Correct. And that is a virtual meeting, but it will be at the Hood School. So uh, I, I'm going to recommend that anyone that wants to attend from the school committee, similar to the way we've been attending in person at the Hoods at, at the DLL, we could attend at the Hood School. Um, there will be some students there, um, but most students will be virtual. And the members of the public and the press and, and everyone still would be remote as we've been doing. So there would be a virtual meeting but our location would be at the hood if you so choose. Okay, so that is on Thursday, December 10th at 6.30 p.m. at the hood or right. virtual. And if there's nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All second. Okay, I guess we'll do a roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Chris? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana. Aye. Diamond. Aye as well. Thank you, everybody, for the time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all for everyone. And I, I forgot Thanks. to mention in my report that Mr. Connolly, in addition to being all that he does for us, he is a coach of his children's teams and also of a cross country team. And you want to share it, Michael? Uh, we won the league championship today. So congratulations. Nice. Congratulations. Good day. nice. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for sitting through the meeting though, that you only had to speak at once. <laughs> no I, know, I, did, I did feel like this could have been one that Michael could have had a, a night off. Um, Worries. Huh. Yeah, but thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank thank you. Patrick, right. quick question. Yes. Um, did you move the advisory, the parent advisory council um from I, tomorrow to the fourth. Yes. Okay. Just am I supposed to make go sure. to this still? Am, am I, I go. To, I've always am, gone. Do I? Am I, I supposed to go to those as subcommittee meetings, Janine, or is that just a, a sort of an offshoot group? It's just an offshoot group, yeah. and I've just gone because I used to be a president at the Hood, so I just sure. kind of keep in touch. <laughs> yeah, I I'm unable to that meeting tomorrow. Um, so I've moved it to December 4th. And I think uh, I did, I, I believe everyone received that information. I, I hope that you, maybe you were not on there. I'm sorry. No, no, I did. I just wanted to confirm because I'm like, well, why does he have one on the 4th if we have one tomorrow? So I don't think I'm in the normal group there, Patrick. So I don't, I mean, whatever. If you want me to attend like I did the last time, I'm happy to. And if you don't, I don't need to either. So, okay. Whatever you prefer, whatever you prefer. Um, okay. However, however, it's supposed to work. I'm willing to do that. I just um, it, there's no meeting tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'll have a good Thanksgiving. You too. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.